Prescott takes the snap, he's back, he throws one left, and the pass is intercepted by Janoris Jenkins. He jumped the route on Dez Bryant, and he gets the interception. Back to throw, he looks left, he throws left, he's got Dez who caught it and fumbled it. And the Dallas Cowboys 11 game winning streak is going to come to an end. The New York football giants have spent big money on three free agents this offseason, and all three have paid off so far, especially our next guest who has three interceptions this season, picking off Aaron Rodgers and Dak Prescott, and is coming off a huge game against Dallas, handing the Cowboys their second and only two losses of the season. We welcome Janoris Jenkins to First Take. Thanks so much for being with us. Uh, thank you. Janoris, let's talk about that Cowboys game. Dez Bryant uh -huh. is clearly not the same receiver when he plays your team. He has just two catches for 18 yards in two games against New York. How are you able to shut him down? Uh, well, I stuck with the game plan. Um, we played together as a defense. And um, I just try to not to get, get my hands on him exactly, you know, just mirror him off the line because I noticed that when you try to press him and uh, get your hands on him, he like to push off and, you know, try to get open. Janoris, uh, you know, there's a lot of press on you recently. In the last couple days, um, it seems right. like you know you're, you're, that, that there's a push in the media to expose you to the fans, etc. And one of the things that's come out is you don't like to be called Janoris. You like to be called Jackrabbit, correct? Right, 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 man. I like to be called Jackrabbit. Now, how long has this been going on? Uh, it's been going on since my freshman year in college. Um, I went to school early in January at the University of Florida. And um, my coach just threw me out there. Uh, I ain't know no plays. And um, I was so happy to make a few plays. And uh, we got in the film room, and uh, he was like, this kid moving. Boy, you moving like a jackrabbit. And um, ever since that day, I stuck with it. Janoris, I want to go back to the game against the Cowboys this past Sunday. I mean, I'm looking at you guys. Dak Prescott targeted you eight times. You only gave up two catches. You had an interception. You forced a fumble. I want to know what was the mentality for you guys going into the Dallas Cowboys game? Was it just something pivotal that y'all had to do, had it, having to win that game? Or were y'all tired of all of this talk about the Cowboys? Oh, uh, man, we just went in just to be the best defense on the field that, 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 that night, man. And um, I can say we did. Um, we played together. Everybody swarmed to the ball. Um, and we made plays. Janoris, uh, excuse me, Jackrabbit. Uh, right. Coming into right, this Max. season, <laughs> when the Giants gave you that huge contract, I'm a Giants fan, a big Giants fan, and my thought was, right. boy, he's a good corner, he, but he's like a, a, a risky corner. Just watching, you know, the Rams as much as I did, he'll, he'll gamble. I don't know if he's a shutdown guy. Boy, it's a lot of money to give a guy who I thought of as maybe a B-plus kind of corner. Watching you this year, you're playing right. like an A-plus. Now, is that me not paying close enough attention or is there actually a qualitative difference in your game this year? Oh, man, I, I can say it's kind of kind of both. Um, you know, I was at St. Louis and, um, you know, good organization. But I, I feel like uh, somebody always had to make a play over there. And um, I wanted to be that guy because we always, you know, either down by 21 or in a close game where somebody needs to make a play to where, you know, I'm here at the Giants and um I can just play within the scheme, you know, because I, I depend on my offense. I, I know we got a good offense, and um, I just play within the scheme and then play to the best of my ability. So playing with better players has made you a better player, in other words? Oh, it's not, not, not better player. It's just not playing from behind all the time or not playing in a close game or things like that. Not having to jump rock because somebody got to make a play. Is yeah. that coaching Jack staff Rabbit, you're talking about to or you. organizational differences? In, between the Giants and the Rams? It's just probably, I'll just say, the, like the, 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 the coordinators, you know, they're just different. Jack Rabbit, I want to get to you personally because uh, Max alluded to it to some degree. Coming into this season with the New York right. Giants after four years in St. Louis, you were right. labeled to be a boom or a bust. You can make plays, you can make things happen, but also... It was only a couple of guys like Screen and Patrick Patterson that had given up more touchdowns than you coming into this season. When you came right. to the New York Giants, were you on what what kind of personal mission were you on, considering the experiences that you had in St. Louis over the previous four years? Oh man, shine when the lights on, man. That's it. Just come out and play hard, play the best of my ability, and um uh, do my job. Each week, coach calling me to do what I got to do, 
And um, he always tell me, uh, me the, either me or DRC can be the one to change the game. And um, just go out and play hard. Jack Rabbit, you can do well, what, you can do what you do because of practice, obviously, and you guys uh, working on things there. What's it like going against Odell Beckham day in and day out? It's competitive, man. I mean, we both like to compete. Um, we understand that either he gonna make a play, I won't make a play. Some days uh, he gonna get the best of me, I'm gonna get the best of him. But at the end of the day, we were making each other better. Um, we live by iron shopper and iron around here, and um, I think that's what, what we do a lot. Where do you guys believe you are right now? When we look at the NFC, we've been talking about the Cowboys. No one can ignore the Seattle Seahawks. But at the same right. time, the Giants are right in the thick of things, along with Tampa and Detroit and everybody else. So what I'm asking you is, where do the Giants, who missed the playoffs six of the last seven years, where does this Giants organization believe it is right now in terms of the upper echelon of the NFL, and particularly the NFC? Oh, man, I ain't going to put no you know, place out there. But I'm going to say, like I've been telling everybody, we can be special as we want to be. Um, all we got to do is focus on one game at a time and be the best unit on the field, uh, whether it come offense, defense, or special teams. Uh, Jack Rabbit, there's, you know, as a Giants fan, I've noticed that in the NFL, you have some very good ownership, especially in Northeastern teams with family traditions like the Maras, like the Roonies in Pittsburgh. Stephen A is a big Steelers fan. And you were quoted yeah. recently, in the last day or so, as saying that Kroenke, on the Rams, you weren't even supposed to look at him if he was in, in camp, if he was walking through. You were supposed to not even talk to him or anything like that. And you, you contrasted that with the culture around the Giants. Can you speak to that a little bit? Uh, it's, just, it's just different, man. I mean, you know, St. Louis is a great organization. Um, it's nothing that was bad over there, but it's just different. Uh, and here in New York, you know, it's winning. Everybody want to win. Everybody want to go out and make that play that can't nobody, can't nobody on the other team make. And um, it just made me feel like I'm home. It's, well, it's, it's, well, Jack it's Rabbit, good to have I'm you. Gonna, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to personally let you off mm -hmm. the hook when you say that the Rams are a great organization. I'm going to just let that go. I'm going to let that go. I'm going right. to let you slide on that, bro. And I'm going to stick come with on, the New York on, Giants dude. here. How, uh, come on, come on, Jack Rabbit. The, the organization, great organization, great, the Rams. The people behind, the huh? people behind the building, the people behind everything. They oh, okay, people. okay. They're good people. My bad. They're good I'm, people. I'm not talking about yeah. them. You know, you know who I'm okay. talking about. I'm talking about the dude that just got bounced <laughs> out of there. But that's a different subject to oh, another. No, that's a different subject to another. <laughs> okay, day. we'll All say right? that for later. Then. How do, how does it feel to be the only team in the NFL that beat the Cowboys since they're the leaders in your division? <laughs> Feel good, man. We know they was the uh, the head dogs in the division. Uh, we know they uh they got a good offense and a, a pretty good defense, and they they depend a lot on the on the rookies, man. And um, it feel good to be two and zero against those guys, uh, cause uh you know everybody wanted you know them to, the the win, obviously, and um it turned out different. Jack Rabbit, it feels good uh, for you to be on our squad as well, let me tell you. But before I let you go, real quick, holiday season, still got a little Christmas shopping to do. Where can a girl get that hoodie? Oh, man, I, I'll get you one. I'll get you one. Yeah? All right. I'll make sure you get one, yeah. We need a few. We appreciate you. Good luck against the Lions <laughs> and down the stretch. All right, thank you. How will you remember Craig? Um, I can't really put it much better um, than Charles Barkley and Steve Kerr put it obviously they worked with Craig Sager uh, for years uh, they know him better than me better than a lot of people but those of us who have covered the NBA for many years we know how synonymous he is uh, with the NBA in the world of sports and we know what a wonderful human being he was he was always very gentle he was always very kind uh, Charles Barkley put it best when he talked about how he was full of life and he never he's never met anybody that loved life and wanted to live more than Craig Sager. And so uh, you hear about his passing. It was, you know, it's just devastating to all of us who covered the NBA and who have been around him. When ESPN uh, worked the deal out with uh, Turner uh, to allow Craig Sager to cover his first NBA finals, you know, I remember LeBron James asking, how in God's name, after all of these years, 20 plus years, have you never covered the NBA Finals until now. Uh, it just didn't seem right. It just seemed so perfect when he was there for game six uh, for Cleveland and the Golden State because it clearly was where he belonged. And I watched him work the arena. 
just walking around, even beforehand, uh, people wanting to take pictures with him, clamoring for him, thanking him for the strength that he instilled in so many people. Uh, to see the standing ovation that he received during the game was incredibly touching. And then when Steve Kerr spoke last night prior to the Knicks game, Warriors game against the Knicks, uh, Steve Kerr, who, you know, he's a very good man, uh, and we all know that about him, he actually put a smile on my face because by him saying and reminding us all how Craig Sager would have wanted uh, us to conduct ourselves, for it to be a celebration to some degree, uh, it made me smile because I thought about the last time I had spoken to Craig Sager. Craig Sager walked up to me, and we all know Max and Molly that he's very well known for the colorful outfits mm -hmm. that he wears. And um, he walked up to me, and like Kobe Bryant said on Mike and Mike earlier today, everyone always looked forward to whatever outfit we were going to see Craig Sager in because clearly he owned it. You know, he, he could pull it off. Most of us couldn't. Most of us wouldn't even think about trying. But when it came to him, he would, tr he would pull it off every time, and, you know, he didn't care. This is what he loved. That's how he loved to look. God bless him. And so he came up to me, and he said to me, Stephen, you look great. And I looked around, I was like, what, what's wrong with my outfit? Why is he saying that? I mean, do I have one something <laughs> wild or whatever the case may be? And that's what I thought about last night. It just put a smile on my face because I remember how I was questioning the outfit that I had on because he was telling me how good my outfit looked when he saw me at Quicken's Loans Arena. And so I just think about it from that perspective. I'm sad for his lovely wife, Stacy, his five kids, uh, the TNT family. I know all of those folks. And um, he was a special man and he meant a great, great deal to the NBA community and we're all going to miss him. It's a devastating low for, uh, loss for, for everybody associated with the NBA, with the world of sports, and for folks out there battling cancer. You know, my, my words to them, including people like my own mom, is just keep the fight up, keep going, keep pushing, uh, because Craig Sager certainly did that to the best of his ability. And uh, as sad as it is to see him gone, uh, we owe him an incredible debt of gratitude for the life that he lived and what he was willing to put on display and share with us all. Uh, we're all better because of it. Yeah, I, I think it, that Craig Sager's life shows that if you treat people with kindness and you have a sense of humor about yourself and um, use obstacles and hardships in your own life as a source of inspiration um, to uplift others, you will be loved. And I think what's most telling about the way Craig Sager lived his life, and I did not know him personally, we crossed paths a couple times, but didn't know him personally, had no personal relationship. And as a basketball fan and as a, a person who lives in this culture, uh, I was very sad, of course, like everyone else, when I heard he passed and, and was upset even when, you, when you know, the, fir the news first became public that he was um, struggling with his illness. Um, I think the greatest tribute is the people who knew him best, the closer they were to him, the more upset they were, the more they loved him. That's not the case with everyone. Uh, but in, in this building, I'm in L.A. now where, where I did Sports Nation for three years before joining this show, Stephen A. And in this building, everyone was obviously sad and depressed about it. But the people who knew him were weeping. The way Charles Barkley was crying on television, Michelle Beadle and Rachel Nichols were weeping yesterday. And when we discussed how we were going to handle it, because I, I uh, did Sports Nation for old time's sake while I was here uh, yesterday, I appeared on the show throughout the show, and we had all these things planned, and then the news came out five or ten minutes before we went to air, whatever it was. And uh, the question was, how do we handle something like this? And the decision, at first, maybe we just make the whole thing a tribute to Craig Sager, and the decision ultimately was, what would he do? And how would he want this handled? Probably embarrassed by the attention. But if you look at how he lived his life, he went to work, didn't ask anyone to feel sorry for him, um, and, and did his job basically up until the very end, without asking for special treatment or anything like that. And so it was decided the best way to honor him and his legacy is to carry on and do the show. So we did a, 
a tribute segment off the top, as, as we are doing here, and discussed it because you can't ignore it, obviously, and then carried on and did the show as he did, as he carried on. Um, I, I, I just think, as I said, the greatest tribute to him is the, you'll notice in the media reaction, people watching at home, the people who knew him best are the ones who will be weeping today. Well, the thing that resonates with me as well is uh, the great Ernie Johnson, who's also who's a cancer survivor, who would go to see him to fire him up and inspire him. And it turns out that it was the other way around. That's what Craig Sager did for him and so many others. And you think about the battles that people are fighting every single day in an effort to conquer cancer. And you think about the Jimmy V uh, Foundation and what ESPN has been closely associated with and synonymous with for decades. And you think about all of those folks out there in such desperate need, not just of treatment, not just for a cure, but also for inspiration along the journey, along the battles. And then you think about a guy like Craig Sager, who would go to work and work a game at night and then turn around and fly to Houston the next day, the next morning to receive his chemo and then depart from there and go right back on the road. And then you sit there and you think about the times that you said to yourself, I'm tired, I'm not feeling well, I can't go, but there's really nothing wrong with you. You knew what was wrong with him and somehow, some way, he showed up to work every chance he got. And it just serves as the greatest inspiration to all of us about what, what we can be made of if our heart and our mind is truly committed to something that we love so, so dearly. And I just think that that's uh, an important message to reap uh, from it all. But again, my heart goes out to his family, mm -hmm. his loved ones, the TNT family, uh, thanking uh, Charles Barkley, Kenny Smith, Shaq and the crew, uh, especially to Steve Kerr and that tremendous tribute to Greg Popovich, who spoke uh, very sincerely about him. The man was, was loved in a great, great way by anybody associated with the, with the NBA community. And the players, I think, are doing an incredible job of expressing their love and affection uh, to him and their gratitude for all that he means and he meant to the game of basketball. And I also want to add, Stephen A., our heart also goes out to anybody battling cancer. Our prayers are with them, including, including your mother as well. Thank you. Thank Craig you. Sager, gone way too soon at the age of 65. He will be missed, but not forgotten.